How's it going? First Alliance, it is good to be with you and remember in worship how good our Father is and reflect on the good gifts that he gives each one of us. I'm excited to continue our study in 2 Corinthians. God has been moving us through in his timing as we've studied this book and it again works perfectly for the things that he is saying us specifically today about being a part through giving of what he is doing all around the world. And so I want to invite you to open your Bibles, power up your apps, whatever you're using, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That's where we're going to be this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And as you're turning there, I want to say thank you to all the dudes that filled out that dude's Bible study survey to let me know what time would work best for you. And uh, we're, you're going to get some more information this week, and we're going to launch that thing here in the not-too-distant future. And so ch keep checking your email uh, boxes early this coming week uh, to find out more information about that. As you're turning to 2 Corinthians 9, let me pray, and we'll jump right into it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our time of worship together, our time of lifting you high and declaring that we're ready. We're ready for you to reveal more of yourself to us. We recognize that we don't have what it takes to live the life that you desire for us, but out of your goodness, you give us the gift of the Holy Spirit to come and fill us, to come and give us power, to come and convict us of sin, and to come and set our hearts towards you so that we can continue to grow, continue to mature, and continue to take the next step in what it means to follow you. I pray that you teach us this morning through your same spirit and through your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9 starts in verse 1 and it says, Paul is writing, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. And I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. One of the things that I love about God's word is every time you read it, God can show you something different. A friend of mine says that every time you open and read God's word, you're one Holy Spirit breath away from an encounter with God. And this passage, this chapter has spoken to me in a totally different way than in any of the previous times that I've read it. This is a great chapter. Both 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 are great passages to talk about the, the impulse of every follower of Jesus to give generously with their finances. But one of the things that really jumped out to me this time as I was reading and studying for our time today was the beauty of the narrative that was happening. Keep in mind that the church in Corinth that Paul is writing to is in the region of Greece. And just north of that were the churches of uh, Philippi and Thessalonica in the region of Macedonia. And then if you circle all the way around east of the Mediterranean Sea, you'd get back to the region of Jerusalem where the uh, original church began on the day of Pentecost. And there's some persecution and some famine happening in Jerusalem. The believers there were suffering and they weren't able to care for their own personal needs and continue to advance the good news of Jesus Christ at the rate that God wanted them to. And so Paul here is talking about the connectedness of all believers to one another through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where we live, whether we're in Columbus, Ohio, uh, or we're watching from Pakistan or from uh, Spain or any of these things, we know that we're connected through Jesus. And therefore, we're members of one another. And God has called it to our attention to be people that take care of one another 
and also help those to continue to advance the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the same plea that Paul is making to the Corinthian church. And I believe as we've been invited as a movement of the Christian and Missionary Alliance to participate in this Great Commission Sunday, that God is calling us to remember that we too are connected to our international workers and to our believers in other parts of the world and that God is using them in significant ways to bring gospel presence and access to people and places that have never heard the good name of Jesus before. And so uh, there's the beautiful narrative of connection that's happening here. And again, Paul reminds them that giving isn't just a noble action, but it is a ministry. It's the ministry of giving, the, the service of giving. And we are all as followers of Jesus Christ called to this ministry. He, he's called us because he's a generous God and he wants us to reflect his generosity as well. And so... How are you, you serving in this area? Even during this time where things are up in the air economically, I know some of you have even experienced being furloughed from your jobs this week. We're praying for you that God would continue to provide for you. I would pray for you that in this season that you would turn to the Lord and cling to him to trust that he'll provide everything that you need. Paul goes on in verse 3 and he says, But I'm sending these brothers to be sure that you really are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready but I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. We see in these verses that Paul is saying, hey, we're on our way there. We're, we're going to come and pick up the thing that you said that you were collecting. You were involved. You experienced uh, the need and the connectedness in line with this. And you have been preparing yourself in order to give. And so we're on, we're, we're on our way. Make sure that you're ready. This is one of the great principles of giving that we can embrace for today as well, that we would be ready givers. There's a thoughtfulness and prayerfulness that God is inviting us into when it, when it comes to giving. Whether it's to your local church, whether it's to another organization that's making a difference in the city, or whether it's to uh, Alliance Missions and what God is doing all around the world, God is not inviting us to look at a flow chart and say, this is the number that I fall into. This is my tax bracket and my giving uh, number. He's inviting us to prayerfully come to the Lord and be ready with the things that God has put on our heart. Remember that when it comes to our finances, God always wants to use our finances to capture our heart. And giving is an opportunity to come to him in relationship and say, Lord, what would you have me give? How would you like me to give generously? Paul says we should be ready, but also that we should be willing. That we wouldn't give grudgingly or in other places that we wouldn't feel like there's a compulsion or a coercion to give. And so this is not a giving plea by any means to try to compel you. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how other even Christian leaders have done that sinfully in the past, um, but, but that's not the case. My heart for you is a pastoral heart that says your finances are a way for God to capture your heart. Are you withholding them from him or are you offering them to him freely, not begrudgingly, but willingly? So we should be ready and we should be willing to give in order to see the good news of Jesus advance here in the city, in our lives, and all around the world. Verse 6, Paul continues on and he says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. This is what I was referencing just a little bit ago, that there have been 
Christian leaders who have said, you need to sow your seed of giving in order to get financial blessing in return. And on first reading, it would seem that that would be the case. If you sow a seed of finances, shouldn't you get finances in return? But that's not what Paul is really saying. Paul's not saying that if you invest by giving to a certain ministry, that God will bless you financially. That, 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 that doesn't make sense that you, would, uh, that you would give freely in order to get abundantly. That's actually a selfish motive. That's not a generous motive. It doesn't reflect the heart of the Father. God doesn't give things to us so that he gets more in return. He gives things to us because it's for our good, for our pleasure, and for his glory. And, and so we don't give uh, to churches. We don't give to ministries. We don't give to missions so that God makes us richer. That's not how this works. And so Paul explains what this really means uh, in the next few verses. In verse 7, he says, You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. When you plant in generosity and give willingly of your finances, it doesn't mean that you're going to harvest an overabundance of financial blessing. God does promise that he'll provide all of your needs, that he will increase your resources. But the harvest that Paul is talking about here in the New Living Translation is translated a harvest of generosity. In other translations, it says a harvest of righteousness. You see, when you plant generosity, when you plant in financial giving from the heart that God has given, given you to give cheerfully, to give willingly, he returns to us righteousness. And righteousness is always meant to be lived out in relationship with one another. Another way that you could translate righteousness is right relationship. And so Paul is again returning to the reality that when we give, we are recognizing the reality that we're all connected. And when I give not from a place of selfishness that says I'm the most important, but from a place of generosity, love, and caring concern, we no longer have things that are between us. There's a freedom that I experience and a harvest of right relationship. There's a, a beautiful thing that is happening here. Now, we can trust in God's character. We can trust in, in uh, the reality that God always provides. Verse 8 says God will generously provide. We can know that God always provides for us. That gives us more assurance to be able to give. That even when we give outside of what we think uh, makes sense or what we have, that God has promised to always provide. And he goes on and he says that God has always, or God always provides enough to share. Not, does, not only does God always provide enough for our daily bread, enough for what we need for this season or for this day, but God always provides enough to share. As it says in verse 8, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. God always provides. And God always provides enough to share. Now, we all have different ideas of what that looks like and what our needs are. We have different needs. We have different sized families, different uh, seasons in life. But God always provides. And God always provides enough to share. This reminds me of a story of a time when I got to visit 
uh, some of our international workers in Ecuador. We got to go around and see what God was doing in, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance churches in the country of Ecuador. And as we were driving from one church to another through some of the back roads, we drove by uh, a huge landfill next to the side of the road. And we noticed that in that landfill, there were actually lean-to shacks and shanties where very poor people were living. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine making my home in a garbage dump. And the international worker that we were with shared the story of a time that they were there providing some food for some of the families that lived there. And they passed out a sandwich to a small boy. And the small boy had recently put his trust in Jesus Christ, and he was so overjoyed by this sandwich, not because he was going to have a meal that day, but he looked up at the international worker and said, I can't wait to share this with my friends. You see, no matter where we are and what we feel we have, we can trust God's promises. No matter if we feel like we have more than enough right now. We can trust God's word that says he will always provide. And he will always provide enough to share. The blessings that we receive from the Lord are never meant to be things that we keep for ourselves. They're always meant to be distributed to those around us and to those all over the world. And finally, Paul ends this passage in Verse 11 through the end of the chapter, he says, Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they'll give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will provide that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. There's something that we will receive in addition to a harvest of generosity or righteousness or right relationship. It's the understanding that when we give, and we give regularly, thoughtfully, not under compulsion, but joyfully in response to what God is doing in our life, that we will draw others closer to God. What's the result of the Corinthian church's generous giving to the people in Jerusalem? It was that they would give thanks, not to them, they're not expecting a thank you note in the mail, uh, a gift for their gift. Hey, if you give, we'll send you this DVD or gift basket. That's not what they were expecting. The result was that the people in Jerusalem would give thanks to the Lord. Their giving, the Corinthian church is giving, though they'll never meet these people that live on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea is that those people will turn their attention to God. You know, when you give to something like Alliance Missions, when you give regularly, thoughtfully, prayerfully, and joyfully to what God is doing all around the world, you don't give so that you can have your name highlighted in some magazine or some building named after you or any of those things. You give so there's people somewhere on the other side of the world from you that will hear the good name of Jesus Christ and will be drawn into relationship with him, will be saved from their sins and saved to the promise of an eternal life with God forever. We don't give it for what we get. We, get it so that other, we give it so that other people will draw near to the Lord. And as we embrace this reality, that we're deeply connected with one another and that we can trust the Lord to provide enough and provide enough to share, we can echo Paul's words in verse 15 that say, thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. 
There's an expression of worship and adoration that comes when we experience the freedom of not trying to control and manage our finances, but realizing that God wants us to give all of our treasure, to, to allow him access to all of our finances, because where our treasure is, there our heart is as well. And when we give our treasure over to him to use for what he wants to do, we know that he has our heart, the fullness of our heart. And we can express the freedom of worship that Paul does with the Corinthians as well. So my prayer for you is that during this next week, you would prayerfully consider what God is asking you to, to give towards the work and expansion of his kingdom all around the world. We get to be a part through this little ministry of giving. We get to be a part of declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to people in places that have never heard, that have never had access. And so I invite you to pray, and then I invite you to give in response to what the Lord is leading you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great work. We thank you for your work in our lives to transform our hearts, to transform uh, our minds, to transform our allegiances, to transform the things that have captured us in the, in the past. And Lord, we know that in order to declare with freedom in all areas of our life, we also must submit our finances to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to seal these words in our heart through your Holy Spirit, that you would move us to generosity, that we would sow generously so that we can reap generously, reap righteousness, reap right relationships, and know that we've given all we can for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.